vascular plant structure growth and development. I just want to give you um, a little bit of a reason as to why we're skipping ahead. So we went chapter 29 and chapter 30, which were about plants, and then your book goes into um, basic information about some of the other groups and then comes back to plants for details. My thinking is we're already studying plants. We've already got them in our mind. Let's dig deeper now before we have to refresh. So um, this chapter is deep. So just giving you a little bit of a heads up right now, there, we're getting back down to the molecular basis for a little bit. We got to understand, you know, we've, we've talked about basic structure, but now we're going to understand how it all works and um, that kind of thing. Not to scare you off, it's nothing like photosynthesis or respiration or anything like that. Is that killing me? Yeah. All right, so just overview, um, plants normally are more reliant on the environment for their morphology, all right? Now, to an extent. Now, they are pre genetically predetermined to take a, a specific basic overall shape, but the environment tweaks that shape. So in other words, you could have a clone, I mean, literally go in the, go in the laboratory and make a clone seed of an oak tree, plant them both, and they are not going to grow with the same branches and the same leaves and everything. They are going to both be reliant on how much light is available in that area, how much water is available, and what's towering over them. And what all those kind of environmental factors are going to shape the tree. So that's what's going to um, be more important. Now that's a whole lot different than animals because we are genetically predisposed to have two arms, two legs, and you know to have two ears, and, and we are... That's all coming from genetics. Very few plants are totally reliant on genetics. They're going to be mainly reliant on, genetics are going to play a part, obviously, but they're going to be more reliant on the environment. But there are some um, exceptions to that. And the, the caption here are plants, computers. Well, the reason that is is because we are going to look at one that looks like it was designed by a computer. So this is Romanesco. I showed you this on on um, Monday afternoon, just as a teaser to this, this chapter. This is a, um, a member of the broccoli family. It is edible. I've never had it. I don't think I could eat it. It's way too pretty. But this is known as a fractal. So a fractal is a re something that repeats over and over and over and over again as a pattern. So if you look right here, this particular lobe is a little bit larger. And what it does is this one grows, and then this one started next, and then this one, and so on. And it goes in a spiral. But each one of the lobes have lobes within them that are starting. So you see a spiral pattern on it. And then close up, you can see that each one of those have spiral patterns. So this is 100% being dictated by genetics. So this is an unusual case. This is not going to be the way for um, all plants. But it is a very cool thing. That is a math uh, pattern known as a fractal. And you can you know, see them in artwork and everything, but this is nature, which is very cool. All right, so um, getting back to basics. So we're talking about the biological hierarchy. This is going back to chapter one of your textbook. And plants, being a living organism, are going to have to follow right into that. So their basic fundamental living part is made up of cells, as is anything that's living. That's the fundamental unit of life. Cells collectively together can form tissues, and when you do that, that tissue can now take on function. If you put enough tissues together, you can get an organ, and that's basically what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about in this chapter the tissues and organs of flowers and what their functions are. And at any time you have a question, just stop me and let me know. Our main organs are the roots, stems, and leaves. So we'll take them apart one at a time. And just a basic um, overview of how they got the way they are, the way they look. The roots are 100% going to be reliant on what happens above ground. And what goes on above ground can't do anything if it doesn't get the nourishment from the roots. So they're going to be um, reliant on one another. So the plants are going to take up the mineral and the water from below ground. That's going to be supplied to the rest of the plant. And then 
upstairs, up in the um, above ground area, plants are going to take up the carbon dioxide, absorb the light, turn it into sugar, and feed the um, entire plant as well. So we have two systems. We have three organs, but one of the organs is the root system, so that's what you see right here. And the other two organs, the stems and leaves, make up the shoot system. So the shoot system is everything above ground. It includes the stems, all of them, the leaves, and all reproductive parts like the flowers. Okay, So um, everything basically above ground is going to be part of the shoot system. All right, so roots cannot grow unless they have the energy to do so, and the energy is coming from the photosynthesis that's occurring on the shoot system. So the shoot system is making the sugar through photosynthesis. We will talk about the tissues that send those sugars down to the roots, but um, we're not quite there yet. And then the above ground is going to need the water and minerals. They need the components to put together to make the sugar. So all of that's going to come from below ground. So each is going to be reliant on one another. So let's take them apart one at a time, looking at the roots. So the roots, again, is one of the three organs, and their three main uh, functions are to hold the plant in place, to anchor it, doing that absorbing. So roots are different from what we talked about with bryophytes that only had a rhizome down there. It just held it in place. It couldn't absorb. Roots really can absorb, so they're absorbing minerals and water. And then as we are going to see, some roots are specialized for storing carbohydrates for future use. So if you look at the little seed, picture that in your head, your tiny little seed. We plant it, we water it, and it begins to germinate. So out of the top comes the two cotyledons or the one cotyledon, depending on if it's a, mon a monocot or a dicot. But below, we don't think about that as much, is the first root. That is known as the primary root. All right, so it is emerging below and as everything is coming up above the ground. So the primary root is that very first one, and then it is going to continue to grow until it gets large enough to start branching. And when it branches, the little branches that come off of that primary root are known as lateral roots. And they can get quite extensive, but this is going to anchor it in, and it's also going to give it um, enough surface area that it can um, absorb, absorb more. All right, so um, this is an over-exaggerated picture of a tap root, but it was to prove a point. So you may not realize it, but if you see a tree above ground, that's usually where they grow. <laughs> if you see a tree, everything that's going on above ground is just as large below ground in most cases, right? So if you see a 200-foot tall tree, you've probably got a 200-feet long tap root. Below. So they grow pretty much equally above ground and below as far as their mass goes. Now this is over exaggerated. This is showing our taproot being a little bit bigger, but this is just again to prove a point, okay? So the, the reason for this is um, number one, stability, but as much mass as has to grow up here, we've got to have that much material being funneled into it. So the taproot is usually going to be the primary root just continuing to grow straight down. Not all plants, this doesn't apply to everything, okay? Not all plants actually have a taproot system, but most of your big trees do. Most. I'll show you some exceptions to that in just a moment. So um, that taproot, as it digs deeper into the soil, it is continuing to branch off with all the lateral roots the majority of the absorption is actually going to come from the tips of all of the lateral roots and the tip of the taproot. But the, the main bulk of that taproot is not really, it's not there for that purpose. It's an anchoring stake in the ground, if you will. And it is also um, the growing primary growth for that tree. The other type, other than a taproot, is a fibrous root system. This is a fibrous adventitious root. I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. But this is the type of root system that we see with most monocots and a lot of the um, house plants that we, that we plant. Rather than having the big, long taproot, you have that, that really, really um, netted, kind of all-encompassing, take-up-the-whole-pot type root system. 
Uh, the reason for this is most plants, house plants and, and uh, such, are low to the ground, which means they're available to herbivory. So you've got animals coming along munching on them. An animal is very easily going to be able to tip over a plant that doesn't have a lot of stability. So a plant with a taproot, a plant that only grows this high is only going to have a taproot this high, this long, and it's going to tip over easily. So rather than having a taproot system, they have this type system, this fibrous, um, really branching out type pattern root system. So what happens is the primary root that becomes a taproot in the other type plants, it comes out as the basis for the lateral, root, lateral roots to start, but then it dies off. And then all the lateral roots produce lateral roots. And then those lateral roots produce lateral roots, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so all it is is continual branching off of roots. Okay, so they continue to do that. So the tap root is not as important there. Um, anybody ever planted a uh, something like um, ivy? I've got an ivy at home that's very old and... It's in a pot, but it, that pot sat in one spot for so long that the taproot broke through the pot and grew into the ground. Anybody ever experienced that? You ever had it? Yeah? Um, it was given to me, and the man that gave it to me had a terrible time getting up. As a matter of fact, the pot it was in broke because he was trying to pull against the taproot. It, it did go into shock for a while, but it didn't die, so... I repotted it in another pot, and it's like it's sitting in one spot. It did it again because I wanted to bring it in for the winter last year, and I couldn't move the pot. And it's because the taproot has grown right through the pot again, and it's anchored itself. But it did fine through the winter, so I don't have to worry about it. But that that is just you know giving you an idea of how large they can get that it literally I can't pull it up. So um, and it's I've only had it for a couple of years, so it grew pretty quick. Now, the term right here, adventitious, that is a um, term that is given for a root that grows from something you don't expect it to grow from. And in this case, they're talking about we've got roots growing from lateral roots. We've got lateral roots growing from lateral roots. So that's um, why they call this an adventitious root. But I'm going to show you some other uh, types of roots as well, though, in a minute that are um, considered adventitious roots because they're growing from places that you don't expect them to grow. Okay, so I've already stated that most of the absorption is coming from the root tips, from the tips of either the primary root or the tips of the lateral roots. So surface area is key. There, the more surface area there is, the more absorption can occur. So most roots grow these tiny little root hairs that you would really have to look very, very closely at the, at the roots to be able to see them. But this is going to increase surface area. So most of these little root hairs are only one cell thick. So water can be absorbed in them very easily. It's transferred over to the vascular system that we haven't talked about yet, but we will get there. And then it's absorbed up in, into the rest of the plant, into the shoot system. In addition to root hairs, though, some plants also develop mycorrhizal um, re relationships. And does anybody remember what that means? Michael Rizzle, Michael Rizzi. Does that sound familiar? Michael Rizzi are fungus based relationships. So they are little tiny fungi, microscopic fungi that live either in between the plant cells or actually inside the plant cells. And a whole lot of plants have these type of relationships. Well, the same thing happens. That's more surface area. So it's actually a symbiotic relationship, especially the ones that live inside of the plant cell because that, that fungus has got a, a um, safe place, safe environment to live in. The plant has got extra absorbing power now because it has that, that um, surface area from the fungus. And the, the fungus doesn't photosynthesize, but the plant does. So the fungus is getting nutrient. And then the plant is getting more water, so it's a, a um, mutualistic type relationship. All right, not all plants follow the rules by prop root or the fibrous root system. Some of them have some very strange roots. Now, this is called a prop root, 
and it is there is a tap root that's going down in the ground but this is a corn plant and if anybody's ever grown corn they have a really strange root looking system this is not where it has been dug out this is actually how they grow they they have roots that come out of the stem up top and then move down about two inch two to three inches above where the ground is and they come out all the way around looking like little fingers they are literally propping that plant up but think about a corn plant now. It's top heavy to begin with. It's got a pretty substantial stalk that's coming up out of the ground, and it is going to catch a lot of wind. All right, you've got two ears of corn on each stalk, and they're heavy. And then you've got big leaves that can catch wind. And if you've ever seen a corn plant right after a windstorm, they don't do very well. They actually lay down really quick. I mean, they're going to be the first one to lay down. However, if you've ever grown corn, you know that they stand right back up again, which is the weirdest thing because I, I grow, I have a garden, and I grow corn. And the first time we had a really, really bad, one of those with the, the, um, the strong winds, I lost all of them, and I'm, I was crushed. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know. But about three days later... They were standing back up. Now, they, you could tell they were leaning, but they were standing back up, and the, that's what these prop roots do. They actually are supporting that, and, and they'll help it to write, try to right itself. If they completely lay down where they're broken off, obviously it's done, but they, they were fine. So that's a prop root. It's an adventitious root because it is growing out of the stem. It's not growing out of the, the uh, root system. Storage roots are unusual. Um, this is a, this is a, looks like a radish, but beets are storage roots, turnips are storage roots. So all of the um, material that's being made up top can be funneled down there and, and held for later use. Pneumatophores are very unusual roots. They grow from the ground up and stick up out of the um, bottom sediments. You see these on anything that grows in the swamp. Cypress trees have nematophores. Um, mangrove trees have nematophores. And the reason for them is because you have, in the bottom of a swamp, you have a muck layer. And oftentimes that muck layer is a an anoxic environment. There's no oxygen there. And so you may be thinking, well, trees don't need oxygen. Trees need carbon dioxide. But that's not true. Trees need carbon dioxide to make sugar. But everything needs oxygen to make ATP. We just don't talk about plants doing cellular respiration. But they require oxygen to make ATP because they've got mitochondria and they make um, ATP the same way animals do. They have an electron transport chain and oxygen's at the bottom of that. It pulls the, the electrons down toward the oxygen. Well, if you're living inside a swamp and all of your roots are completely embedded in an anoxic environment, they need oxygen. So they will send up roots that come from the ground up and they just stick up like little pointy spears. And basically what that's doing is supplying the oxygen to the plant. Um, okay, so this is another strange one. These are called strangling aerial roots. This is a um, strangling fig. And what happens with them, their little seeds will blow through the air, and they, all they've got to do is um, get caught in a crevice where there's enough bacteria and dirt caught that it can actually start. And you see this, you know, I mean, you can drive down the interstate and you see where they've blasted the rock wall and you'll see a tree growing right out of the rock and that's basically what has happened so a seed's gotten caught in the dirt well these these particular um, types of roots are coming from a plant that's capable of making strangling roots meaning they are growing out and then down the structure to the ground and then they'll supply enough um, nutrition and water for that plant to really start growing and they will start sending out more roots and more roots and more roots. So this is some kind of a temple, obviously very old, and there is a tree that the, the um, strangling fig is on sending down. And eventually it's called a strangling fig because it does strangle the tree. It, it cuts off all the light to it, it takes resources from the tree, it eventually will kill the tree.
This last one right here, buttress roots, this is a terrible picture of a buttress root because that doesn't even look like a buttress root. Buttress roots are roots that surround, the, the tree will come down and then the roots will go out at ground level and surround the tree. You find these in areas where the soil is like very, very poor. It doesn't have much nutrient at all. So the tree does not develop an extensive below ground root system. Instead, it keeps a shallow above ground root system and it will form a buttress around the tree so that if the wind blows, it keeps it from being able to move. And oaks, to a degree, do this. If you Certain oaks, not all oaks. Um, but I've got a couple of oaks in my yard that are very, very old and they've got roots that are above ground and some of them are like this big around. They are buttress roots. That's, you know, where the tree is growing massive roots out to hold because oaks will come down pretty easy. You gotta... I have a couple questions. Uh -huh. um, first, what are vines? What are they? Yeah, like do they do anything for the plant or are they just like decoration? Are they like roots? It's probably a, mu a multifold answer. Some of them are epiphytes, which are um, plants that live on other plants but don't harm them. Like a, um, an orchid is an epiphyte. They, they're like they just can live on the humidity in the air, so they don't hurt the plant they're on other than using it as a structure. But some vines can. Um, kudzu, I mean, it'll choke out the entire forest if, it, if it's not kept in check somehow. It'll, it'll completely, like, overtake, and then the trees can't get light or anything. So they are, um, a lot of vines are types of plants that don't require a lot of nutrition. They can grow on, they can grow in just water. So you can take a philodendron and just take a clipping, stick it in there, it'll, it'll make its own roots and keep going. So they don't need a lot of um, minerals, although they'll take off if you give them minerals. Mm -hmm. They'll go, they'll go crazy. So there's different types of vines. Um, and also, are roots hollow? No, not at all. So we will we'll be studying that in this chapter. So we'll show you what's inside of them. Any other, any other questions? Please. All right, ready to go up to the stem now. So the stem is also an organ and we are above ground now. So um, with this is part of the shoot system and it, the stem itself alternates between nodes and inner nodes. So a node is a little area on the stem where leaves have been attached or can attach. And then the inner nodes are the spaces in between those nodes. So we will be looking at um, a little bit more in detail of that, but this is just what the stem is. At the tip of the stem is a growing shoot tip called the apical bud. And this is what's going to cause the elongation of the plant. That is the actively growing spot on the plant, the apical bud. And then you can't see the axillary buds usually. The axillary buds lie inside the um, stem itself and those are areas where you might see a thorn grow or um, some type of a flower might come out there, but an outcropping along the stem. Okay, so you have the apical bud, which is where elongation is occurring, and then you have other types of growth that will happen on that stem. They happen because of axillary buds. So buds are growing areas, okay? All right, so the primary function of the stem is for elongation, not width, okay? So it is to grow high and or long, whatever the case may be. However, some of some of the plants, just like some of the roots that we looked at, some of the plants have developed very um, odd functioning stems. So three of them are shown here. The rhizome that we talked about earlier, and we talked about with bryophytes, the rhizome does not absorb because it is not a root. Rhizomes are actually below ground stems. They do not have the capability of absorption, but they do produce roots in this case, not in, not in the case of a bryophyte. But in this case, rhizomes can have roots come out from um, their side, which will feed the plant. But this thickened area that you see is actually an underground stem. Plants that have rhizomes um, 
if you've ever grown Spanish bayonets, those are, are uh, sometimes an ornamental. Uh, people in Florida grow them a lot because they're, they're literally so sharp on the ends. They're like spears. That's why they call them Spanish bayonets. And you, people will put them below their, plant them below their windows in their house because nobody in their right mind is going to go in there and try to climb in a window. Um, that's one type. But even things like irises, if you plant irises and daffodils, they will spread. It's not that they're dropping their seeds from up top, which they may be doing that as well, but it's actually they're sending out rhizomes below the ground. And the longer you leave a um, planted area with those type plants in it, the more rhizomes they send out and the thicker the area will become. It's almost impossible to get rid of a section that has plants in it that have rhizomes because you're going to pull the plant up you're going to break the rhizome, and the rhizome can send out more roots, and it'll produce another plant. So it's really, really hard um, to get them contained. Not impossible, you'd, but you'd probably have to dig it out a little bit. The other uh, next one is the stolen. So this is a strawberry plant. So stolons um, are above ground but horizontal stems. So they lay on the ground, and some people call them runners. Okay, So they're going to be produced outside of the um, main structure of the plant and their purpose is asexual reproduction. So what you're looking at in this, this particular picture right here, each one of these are stolons coming out and then they will develop what can potentially be a new plant. So these little structures coming out with the leaves can also produce roots underneath and that would be a whole new strawberry plant right there. So that's asexual reproduction. And then last but not least are tubers. Tubers are storage pockets for carbohydrates or other types of plant um, products. A, a potato is actually a tuber. A potato is a stem. And we know that it's a stem because all these little indentations that we call eyes, those are nodes so growth can occur at that point. And has anybody ever planted potatoes or know how to plant potatoes? You do? How do you plant a potato? Don't you like cut them in chunks where eyes are and put the eyes facing? Right. Exactly. You take a potato, you cut it into chunks, make sure it has at least one eye, point the eye up, and you get a plant. So there's no such thing as a potato seed they actually are planted from other potatoes. So the eyes are the areas. Those are nodes, and the, the um, a whole new plant can come up in that area. Any questions on our stems? We're ready to go to leaves then, our last organ. So the leaf is the main photosynthetic organ in most plants. I'm not going to say in all, but in most plants. They have a multifold job. Obviously, they have, they have the uh, chlorophyll in them that intercepts the light, and they have stomata that helps them exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide, so there's a gas exchange. They help dissipate heat in certain circumstances, and some of them have structures on them that will defend against insects being able to crawl across them, and some of them also have toxins through the leaf that can defend against <coughs> pathogens. They had a lot, of, a lot of different jobs. There are two parts to a leaf. There is a flat blade, and there is an attachment stem called a petiole. Every leaf has a version of this, and some of them are very different looking. But there's the flat blade in our simple leaf. A simple leaf is just one flat blade. And then our little tiny stalk here, the petiole, that attaches it to a stem. This down here is known as a compound leaf. Now, how do, how do I know the difference between a compound leaf and this being another stem right here and these being petioles? Well, there's actually a way that we define what a leaf is. A leaf has an attachment site on a stem with an axillary bud. Remember I just said axillary buds are areas of growth? The axillary bud is visible at the bottom of a petiole. We don't have axillary buds here. So this whole thing right here is a leaf. This is probably a rose leaf that looks like a rose leaf. Rose leaves have, um, they come in odd numbers. You have three, five, and seven, 
you get a really big one, you might get a nine leaf rose. Um, five is the most, three and five are the most common and they usually alternate. So you'll have a three leaf come out and then the next one will be a five, and the next one will be a three. And if you ever want to grow roses, you want to prune right above a five leaf um, axillary bud because that is the, the um, ideal area and you will encourage branching right there. All right, so we have um, two different types of leaves based on their vein structure. We have already talked about this. So monocots have parallel veins. They're usually the same diameter and um, lined up right next to each other, whereas eudicots have branching veins. Both of these are eudicots, and they aren't necessarily the same size. So you have a larger one in our simple one here. You have a larger vein down the middle, but you have smaller veins branching off of it. And same here, you have a larger vein down the middle with smaller veins. So a uh, little bit of a difference there. Now taxonomist will identify plants just as much on the leaves as they do on the flower. So you're not always in blooming season. You can't always identify something based on its flower structure because it's not always available to, to see. But the leaves usually are. And... Um, if you have a tree, you don't know what it is, and you want to go try to identify it, there's all these, you know, like, there's charts that you go to. Does it have this kind of this? Does it have this kind of this? And you answer one way or another, and it redirects you, and it's almost doing a family tree and, and guiding you towards the actual um, kind it is. So I have these two trees in my backyard that are really, really cool trees. Never saw them before. And when I uh, bought this piece of land... I asked the builder to leave them because we cleared everything that could fall on the house. And I said, but leave those two trees because those are so cool. They're gnarly. They grow up and then they like, they're like old and gnomish looking and kind of creepy, but they are green year round. They're not um, pines. They have green leaves year round though. They don't lose their leaves. And then twice a year they bloom especially in the June, in the June months. They, they will start at the beginning of June, they will begin to, to bloom, and they will bloom throughout maybe the middle of, um, well, they'll go through July, and then they'll, the, about the middle of August, they'll start, it'll, it'll, they'll all go away. They have these white flowers that look like baby magnolias. They're about this big. And they, or they look like a cross between a magnolia and a dogwood. That's basically about the size they would be. And they're so pretty, and they, and, but they're messy. So are magnolias, for that matter. I kept thinking it has to be something in the magnolia family. And I kept going through all the magnolia trees, and there's a lot of them, and I couldn't find it. So I finally did exactly what I'm telling you to do. You go in there, and it'll, it'll start asking you, does it have this? Does it have this? Is it green all the time? Is it, does it lose its leaves? So you answer all these questions, and then finally you get to the point where the shape of the leaf comes into to play. And I found out that it is a Loblolly Bay tree. It is native from Florida to about this area. This is the cutoff, and you don't see them here very much. They grow in swamps. And um, my, my land is high and dry, though. That's what's so weird about it. But I've got a bunch of them. I've got a bunch of babies that are coming up, too. So, but they grow very slowly. But these two that I have, one of them died just last year. <laughs> But anyway, um, they, they're just so cool looking and everything. I had to know what they were, but it's not, a, not to be confused with a loblolly pine. That is not even the same thing, but loblolly bay tree. Loblolly. L-O-B-L-O-L-L-Y. But anyway, so um, they, are using, they use the shape of the leaf in order to identify. So this is a, a real important structure. Now, just like the stems and the roots, we also have some modified leaves that do things that are a little bit outside the realm of what leaves normally do. Starting up here at the top with our tendrils, those are actually specialized leaves. So the um, cucumbers have tendrils. Um, any, any kind of climbing vine has tendrils. Some kinds of um, peas have tendrils. So field peas, for example, have tendrils because they, they climb or they try to climb uh, grapes. The thing is is that they, they also move. They're pretty neat, and they're not necessarily moving just with the wind. So I found something yesterday, but I did not have time to download it and, and upload it into this to show you. But 
you can look it up if you're interested. It's a time lapse of, of 20 minutes of a cucumber tendril wrapping around a string. And in just 20 minutes time, it grows to, you know, it's growing, but it, it's moving. It's almost like a snake in time lapse. You can't see it when you're looking at it. But it's in 20 minutes time, it does all this, like, it's feeling. And then all of a sudden it touches the string and it just starts wrapping around it and everything. So tendrils are pretty cool, but they're leaves. The um, cactus is a, and it, it's an outlier. It's an example where the leaves don't do the photosynthesis, the stem does. So this flat part on a cactus is actually the stem and the leaves are the spines. So that's something that can win, win you a trivial pursuit question or something. The spines are the actual leaves. All right, an onion is not a bulb. A bulb is totally different. The, an onion is an underground stem, and all of these, there's the stem right up the middle, and all of these petals around it are actually leaves. Yes. And then, last but not least, we have some succulents that have unusual leaves as well that actually can break off, and they are an entire plant. So these are leaves called plantlets, and they can break off, fall to the ground, and root, and you'll get it. So they have a little bit unusual uh, job, so they are modified. All right, and uh, starting now with the tissue. So roots, stems, and leaves are composed of tissue. All right, so we started at the organ level. We're working backwards now. The tissues themselves are dermal tissue, vascular tissue, and ground tissue. So each one of those three types of tissues make up tissue systems, and that tissue system is continuous throughout the whole plant. So um, all structures, roots, stems, and leaves have all three of those in them, okay? And we're gonna tear them down, look at them a little bit closer. In your textbook, it is color-coded and will remain color-coded um, in, a, in a uniform pattern so that you can keep with it. When you see light blue, that is looking, you are looking at dermal tissue there. It's always going to be the outside layer of the plant. Yellow is going to be your ground tissue, and anything you see that is purple is going to be your vascular tissue. And it'll be... Um, it will be uniform throughout every picture or every drawing type picture that we look at. So we're going to break each one of these down. And, oh, but the one thing I wanted to point out here, we've got a cross section of our um, root down here. You see the blue, you see the yellow, you see the purple. So all three tissues are there. Cross section of the stem, all three tissues are there. Cross section of a leaf, all three tissues are there. So in other words, that's what I mean by it being continuous throughout the entire plant. You have all three tissues found everywhere. All right, starting with the, epi the uh, dermal tissue, it consists of the epidermis, which is the outer one layer thick, one I mean one cell thick layer. And then on the outside of that is a layer of wax called the cuticle. And the cuticle prevents too much water from escaping. It keeps it from desiccating, all right? It won't dry out with that uh, waxy layer on there. Also, we have, um, we have little holes in the plant called stomata on the leaves especially that allow gas exchange because gas can't permeate through that wax layer. So the cuticle is a waxy coating that surrounds the entire plant. And then in woody plants, we also have a layer called the periderm. So the, the epidermis is a um, more on your green tissues, and then when you get to the woody areas of the plant, the, the epidermis has been replaced by a periderm. Periderm is much thicker and much um, tougher, so you'll see that on older stems and roots. It, all, it looks woody. All right, so back to the specialized cells um, that allow for the gas exchange. They are holes that are surrounded by two cells called guard cells. And they're kind of half moon shaped. So the hole is kind of like this. And then water can cause the guard, swell, guard cells to swell or to open up. So they will swell shut when they need to or they can open up like this and allow the gas exchange dependent on the environment that they're in. There's also another specialized type of structure called a trichome, 
there's different shapes of trichomes, but these are kind of hair-like structures. If anybody's ever had African violets or anything, you see their leaves are very hairy looking. So the, that, those hair-like structures that are on there are called trichomes. And the whole purpose of that is it makes it difficult for an insect to crawl across. So it, some plants have really, really hairy leaves and people will grow them because just the, the trichomes on there are really um, interesting looking. But there, this, is, this particular picture right here, this is not a drawing, this is not an animation. This is a colorized scanning electron micrograph of a marjoram leaf, which is a spice. Marjoram is a spice. The leaves themselves have trichomes, but they also have these other glandular structures that produce oils. So a lot of your herbs will have these glands on the leaves. That's what gives you that smell that makes it smell wonderful. Eucalyptus, for example. Eucalyptus would look like this. It would have trichomes and it would have the gland cells on there that secrete the oils. So a lot of your, um, your herbs and your spices have this. Okay. Anybody have any questions on any of this? Am I going too fast? Nope. Okay. All right, the next type of tissue is the vascular tissue. Vascular tissue is like the circulatory system, okay? There's two different types of, of um, tissues inside vascu the vascular system. We have xylem. Xylem conducts water and dissolved minerals, and phloem conducts our sugars. So xylem conducts up from the ground. That's what's coming in through the roots. The roots absorb, and that, inf that water and dissolved minerals will make it throughout the rest of the tree. Phloem, on the other hand, flows the other way. Phloem starts in the leaves where photosynthesis is occurring, and it flows toward the ground and throughout the entire plant. So it is spreading the sugar, making it available throughout the whole thing. So we're going to be looking a little bit closer now at what makes up xylem and what makes up phloem in the next um, few slides. Collectively, our vascular tissue is known as the steel. That's both shoot system and root system. So the vascular system is called the steel. In angiosperms, which we've already talked about being the most successful of all of our plants, the steel of the root is a solid central cylinder called the vascular cylinder. And um, as I already showed you in that one, I told you that one slide, this is one you need to memorize because it showed you the structures on the inside of the leaves, what the structures look like on the stems and on the cross section of the roots, everything. So this is what I'm talking about. So in an angiosperm, you're going to have a vascular cylinder and that's going to be the xylem and phloem together and they usually do stay together except for trees, which I'll show you what happens with them. So the steel of the stems and the leaves are divided into bundles, and those bundles show up as um, identifiable structures in those cross sections, and that's where we talk about it. it either forms a star or forms a circle, um, different types of structures of xylem and phloem. All right, so the tissue that makes up the, the dermal tissue was our epidermis and our cuticle. We have our xylem and phloem that makes up the vascular system. And then our last but not least is our ground tissue. That's going to make up the bulk of the plant. There's three different types of ground tissue, though. They're not all going to be the same. So inside our vascular system, inside the vascular tissue, we have a region of ground tissue that's called the pith. It's not a very pretty word, but... It's the pith, okay, on the inside of the vascular tissue. And then the ground tissue on the outside of the vascular tissue is known as the cortex. And we will be talking more in detail on that, but that's it for right now. Ground tissue is also going to include all of the um, specialized tissues for storage, photosynthesis, support, and transport. So ground tissue makes up the bulk of the plant. All right, now, growth. Cells in a plant are at first undifferentiated. They're not ground tissue, they're not dermal tissue, they're not vascular tissue. They're just plant cells that have not specialized yet. They later go on to differentiate into one of those three types, and that is during the development of the plant itself. 
they will specialize into one of five different types of cells. Okay? This is one you also want to probably write down, all five of these. The, the first three are our three ground tissue types, parenchyma, parenchyma, and sclerenchyma. Don't you feel like... Okay, parenchyma. So that's one that's going to be um, fun to, re to remember. Parenchyma, colenchyma, sclenchyma. All right, and then we have xylem and phloem. So five different types of cells in every single plant. And those types of cells, I'm going to break down and tell you what each one of them are for, starting with the parenchyma. Parenchyma um, cells will be the most flexible of all of the types of ground tissue. So what you're looking at right here is a cross-section of a privet cell. These are privet cells, I should say, but it's a cross-section of the leaf. And this big open area in the middle is the central vacuole. If you remember when we looked at, at cells under the microscope, the central vacuole takes up the majority of the cell and all the organelles get squished to the side, and that's what you're looking at right here. So all of the organelles are getting squished to the side here. And these have very, very thin cell walls. There is no secondary cell wall at all. There's just one primary cell wall. It's very thin, and these are going to be very, very flexible. Um, and the most notable thing is that large central vacuole. This is the type of ground tissue that you're going to find in cells that have most of the metabolic function of a plant. So cells that perform photosynthesis are going to be parenchyma cells. Okay. Parenchyma. The next type are the calenchyma cells. And they are grouped together to give strength to the plant. So we see this in the shoot area. It gives support. And they can be identified by a thicker secondary cell wall um, so cross sections of them, the cell wall, is, you can see that the cell wall has a lot more thickness to it. Not as thick as what we're going to see next. But these have a different type of function. These are for strength. This is going to give support to the, to the plant. So you're going to see them. You see right here it says they are living at maturity. So, so were the parenchyma, but that goes without saying, because if metabolic functions go on in those cells, hopefully you would know that those are alive. These don't necessarily, this doesn't look like it would have to be a living cell. But I do want to put that in there because I'm going to show you um, the ones that aren't in just a moment. So these cells are going to provide flexible support, but it still will allow elongation and growth. Okay. The last one, sclerenchyma cells. These are going to be very, very rigid. They have extremely thick secondary cell walls. So the, the whole span across here is the cell wall of this plant. You can't even see the interior of it. So this whole span across the uh, red thickness of this cell is cell wall. And that cell wall is thick because it's, it's been reinforced with lignin. Lignin is a very, very strong substance. It's found in, in cells um, such as nutshells, uh, peach pits, really, really, really hard. And lignin is what gives wood its strength. Okay, So lignin is the uh, main component of the secondary cell wall here. And there's two different types of sclerenchyma cells. The first kind are sclerids, and that's a sclerid right there. Sclerids are going to be found in things that are extremely hard, like the nutshells and the peach pit, right? So that's a really, 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 really hard um, cell. And then these right here are fiber cells. Fiber cells are arranged in threads. So hemp is, comes from a plant. It is actually a... a um, a, sclerench a, a chain of sclerenchyma cells that they make rope out of, right? Very, very strong. Um, you also will see fibers in celery. Now, it's not quite as strong as, as hemp is, but those are fi those fibers that you, you know, get caught in your teeth and everything, those are sclerenchyma cells. And um, so they, they form long threads. All right, so two different types of sclerenchyma cells. These are dead at maturity. 
right? So the first two, parenchyma, calenchyma, those are alive at maturity, but this one is dead, all right? They're just um, extremely strong and giving um, strength to the plant. Okay, so we're looking at xylem now. That's the fourth type of cell. Xylem is made up of two different shaped cells. One is a tracheid, one is a vessel element. Tracheids are right here. They're really long, skinny cells, kind of drinking straw shaped, and they're filled with all these pits. So there's all these holes along the sides of them, and they will lie parallel to one another for the whole length of um, the plant, and they're connected by the pits. The pits line up with one another. So water can flow through this tracheid, and it's tapering down now, running out of room, so the osmotic pressure pushes it right through to the next one, and so on. It'll continue up here. It's, atta it's also attached to this one, so this will carry some of the water, and it, it will conduct that water all the way to the top of the plant because we have hydrogen bonding going on there with those water molecules, and as they move out the top of the plant, it's pulling more water molecules up behind it. So they're also adhering to the sides of the, the tracheid wall, and that's helping them to counteract the, the downward pull of that gravity. Next to them are vessel elements, which do basically the same thing, but vessel elements are shorter and much wider. Vessel elements are aligned. Instead of these are, these are next to each other, these are end to end. So you can see right in the middle there, there is a plate at the end of one cell and at the beginning of another, and it's got perforations in it. So the water can flow right through that plate and right on up. Same thing, hydrogen bonding's causing that. There's also pits on the sides here too, so water's also coming into them from that area. In this cross section of wood, this is showing you these small holes right here, those are tracheids, and the large holes, those are your vessel elements. Both of those types of cells, though, are making up xylem. They are both together, okay? Any questions on xylem? Nope. All right, so um, that, that one was about the tracheids. This is about the vessel elements. I already covered that in the last slide when I just was doing it, but just the, the larger holes here are the vessel elements. All right, and then we get to the phloem. Phloem works basically the same way. It is going to um, have long tube-type uh, cells. In our angiosperm, or in our uh, gymnosperms and our seedless vascular plants, they don't have the same type of phloem, but they do have phloem. They have their sugars transported through cells called sieve cells. They're not quite as complex as the angiosperm flow them. Angiosperms move through sieve tube elements. It's a different shape than just a regular sieve cell. So let's look at them. Sieve tube el elements line up end to end just like we saw with the vessel elements while ago. They have a sieve plate in the middle. It looks like a little um, drain plate. Water can just flow directly through this. It is truly a hollow tube. Because it is a truly hollow tube, it has no room in it for any kind of organelles. But this is a cell. It is a, a, um, an actual cell. So each single sieve tube element has got a companion cell. And that's what you see laying next to it. So this, this is a sieve tube element, and there's its companion cell. This is a sieve tube element, and this is a companion cell. The companion cell has all the organelles and for both cells, the companion cell itself and for the sieve tube element. They are connected to each other with plasmodesmata, which you can see right here. So there's a plasmodesmata, and the companion cell does all the metabolic functions for the sieve tube element. All right, So you always see the two of them right next to each other. Okay, any questions on phloem and xylem? All right, um, some of you may have seen this in Bio 111. I show it both places. This is just an overview of the function of a plant cell. 
Both animals and plants are made up of cells. Their cells have many features in common, but there are a few significant differences. Let's look inside a leaf to take a closer look at a plant cell. First, we encounter a protective cell wall outside the plasma membrane. The cell wall is made from strong cellulose fibrils. Once inside the plant cell, we see the large central vacuole, which regulates the composition of the cytoplasm, creates the internal pressure that is characteristic of plant cells, and stores various compounds produced by the cell. Plants make their own food by photosynthesis in chloroplasts. Light passes through the two membranes of the chloroplast and strikes these green disks where light energy is converted to chemical energy. The sugar molecules produced by photosynthesis can be made into other molecules or broken down for energy. When sugars produced by photosynthesis are broken down, their energy is used to make ATP in mitochondria. ATP powers the work of the plant cell. Most organelles, like mitochondria, are found in both plant cells and animal cells. So the next time you pass by a plant, remember that we have more in common than meets the eye. Okay. All right. Um, the actual growing area is a, an area of a type of tissue called meristematic tissue. So meristems are the area where primary and secondary growth occur. Primary growth, which I've already mentioned, is elongation. So plants have two different, not all plants do have secondary growth, but some plants have two different types of growth, elongation and then girth. They'll grow bigger around. Some plants grow, most plants grow throughout their entire life. They do not reach a certain size and stop. They will continue to grow. And that's known as intermediate growth. So that is not the same as humans or animals because animals will reach a maximum size and stop growing. That's known as determinate growth. So plants continue to grow throughout their entire life because of meristematic tissue or meristems. There are certain areas on a plant, though, that stop growing. Some pla places on the plant do have the determinant growth. For example, leaves. Leaves will grow to a certain size and stop growing. They will continue to live, but they will stop growing any larger. However, the shoot system will continue to keep growing because it's got a meristem on it. So we're going to be talking um, it, about meristematic tissue now for the next uh, few slides. So two types of meristem. We have apical meristem and lateral meristem. The apical meristem is found at the shoot tip and at the tips of all the roots. Both of those continually divide and continually grow and elongate the plant. The lateral meristem is what you see in blue. I don't know if you can tell that it's blue, but there's blue and red lines here. So lateral meristem is going to be involved in girth. Okay, so Meristematic tissue at the tip of the roots and the tip of the shoot is called shoot apical meristem, and that is what's responsible for primary growth. Lateral meristem, shown in red and blue there, there's two different types are going to be responsible for secondary growth. Again, secondary growth is girth, growth in width. Right? Not all plants have secondary growth. So there's two different types of lateral meristem. We have vascular cambion and cork cambion. Vascular cambion is going to add layers of vascular tissue, and cork cambion is going to add layers of our, it's going to turn our epidermis into our, um, pro, into our uh, periderm. So vascular cambion, let's see if we, oh, we're not ready for that slide yet, sorry. All right, so, um, these are constantly dividing cells. So cells in the apical and the lateral meristem don't stop dividing. They will slow down certain times of the year, but they don't ever stop dividing. Cells called initials, and you're going to be, as you're reading your book, 
this is this was confusing for me because I've never heard them called initials except for this t this textbook. Most people have now adapted the name stem cells for what they call initials. But your book also talks about stem cells in there too, so it gets a little uh, fuzzy there. Let me just clarify now so it doesn't confuse you. Initials are cells that never stop being meristematic tissue. They always are meristematic tissue. They don't become dermal tissue, they don't become vessel, um, uh, vascular tissue, and they don't become any kind of, um, which one didn't I say? Dermal, vascular, ground. Okay, so they never become any one of those three. They stay dividing meristematic tissues. Those would be equated to human stem cells. Stem cells are able to become anything, right? Initials can become any one of those three types of tissue, right? So that, because of more talk about stem cells in animals now, they've adopted that term for plants. So Campbell's the only one that I know is still using initials, but they are stem cells that are capable of becoming any other type of tissue. All right, so here we are. This is, this is where our meristematic tissue is. It's, this, is this particular one is at the shoot tip. The, we're looking under a microscope now, so we're just looking a few cells thick. The meristematic tip is protected by two tiny little structures that look like leaves. If you look at them under the microscope, they look like little leaves. But they're just protective uh, structures around the meristem. In brown is the meristem. Okay, So we're over here, and this is rapidly dividing um, cell material. So these are constantly dividing. So here we, we've got two, they, or one has divided and become two. One of them is going to still stay brown, okay? It's going to stay a meristem, and it's going to divide again, and it's going to produce one more meristem and then one differentiated one. So this one right here is going to stay meristematic, but the other one is going to turn into a, a daughter cell that will differentiate. The daughter cell is immature at this point, it will divide and it will grow until it hits a, a mature size and at that point it will differentiate. It will differentiate either into our uh, dermal tissue, our ground tissue, or our vascular tissue. So once they reach a certain size, they differentiate. So growing this way, this is this so we've got our cells dividing. One of them stays brown. The other one becomes the daughter cell. That daughter cell will also divide, and then they will grow in length. They will continue to grow in length until they mature, and they would differentiate into one of the three types of tissue. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, that was, that was primary growth. That's how lengthening occurs. So now we're looking at our... Um, possibly our secondary growth. So we have a woody twig here. Here's our apical bud. So this is where that meristematic tissue I just showed you is going on here. This is lengthening. And we have our axillary buds on the side. This could be another branch. This could be just a leaf. It could be a flower, whatever. But this is an outcropping on the side. But then you get down to this scar. So you've guys, you guys have seen this. If you have a twig, you see this line on there. Where that line comes from is last year. This is where the apical bud was last year. It became winter. The tree became dormant. The apical bud falls off, but it leaves a scar where it was. Okay? So this is one year's growth. This is last year's bud scar. This is where it is now. Go back down the, you could take the twig, you go back, there's the year before last scar. And then here's our other internode. So this is a, if it ended right here, this would be a three-year-old twig. So you don't have to cut a tree down to see how old it is. If you can get to a shoot that has not been broken and is a primary shoot coming off the original root, so or original seed. If you can count how many of these bud scars are on that, you can still tell how old that tree is because that's how many growing seasons it had. How many summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter it went through. All right, so that's another way to age a tree. All right, the secondary growth, this is the other um, 
this is our vascular cambium shown in red and our cork cambium shown in blue. Now this is parallel to the epidermis. This is inside the epidermis and uh, cross section this way. So here's your vascular cambium. Vascular cambium produces both xylem and phloem. So let me go up here to my one cell. So here's my, and by the way, each one of these are only one cell thick. So we have one ring of vascular cambium all the way around the girth of that tree on the inside. It divides and it produces a daughter cell that will become xylem. All right, it divides again, it produces a daughter cell that becomes phloem. It divides again, it produces another xylem. It divides again, it produces another phloem. But we still stay, our vascular cambium stays one cell thick. So these would be what your book calls initials. These red ones would be initials. Okay, they always remain as um, vascular cambium. Now this is showing um, that it's alternating, and that is not how it is. It produces way more xylem than it does phloem. Okay, so it's probably going to be more like a, a two to one or even three to one for xylem um, versus phloem. But this is just to show you that cell is making both of them. Cork cambium lies on the outside of that. So there was our, our xylem. This is after a few lines of division. You can see here's our phloem on this side. We have more xylem than we have phloem. Eventually, we get down here, we have our phloem on this side. We have way more xylem eventually on this side. So it just shows you it's not even. Now, the blue is our cork cambium. So here's, our, here's where we start out. It only moves, it only direct, the direction of growth is in one direction in this case. So it's going to divide and produce one cell of cork, divide again, two cells of cork, and so on. So it is growing in one direction out from the cork cambium. That's producing the periderm. The periderm is going to become, it will be, um, it's outside the phloem, but it's going to be the layers of bark. Bark is not necessarily the brown part on the outside of a tree. There's more to it. It's, a, it's several layers. Those layers are properly called cork. Don't, conf go, don't confuse that with a cork board. That's different cork. This is just a layer of your tree. This is your woody tree, and it is the layers that are on the outside of the cork cambium. Okay? They do become the bark. It's part of it, but they, uh, they have other layers that they become part of. Anybody have any questions on this? All right, so um, primary growth, primary meristem, that is going to elongate our, our um, plant, and it's going to produce uh, mature tissues of the plant. The protoderm, this is the very first divisions. This is like pre-differentiation. Those cells that divided became daughter cells and began to divide and get longer. Those were protoderm. They are going to become dermal tissue. Ground meristem baby daughter cells produce the ground tissue, and then the procambion is going to produce our vascular tissue. So as they grow and they begin to differentiate, that's how they, that's what they are called. Does anybody have any questions on that? I think, um, yeah, this is our last slide. So flowering plants can be divided in their life cycle. There are annuals. They complete their entire life cycle in one year. They bloom out. Annuals tend to produce lots more flowers than any other type because that's their entire purpose in that one time is to produce as many seeds as possible, and then they're done. They're spent. Biennials take two years to do that. They're going to grow fewer flowers. They usually get a little bit larger than your annuals do. They're still ornamental, though. They do produce pretty flowers, so we do. Geraniums are an example of a biennial. And then perennials live many, many years. An oak tree is a perennial. So plants that can live through, you know, several growing seasons. A lot of our shrubbery that we put around our house, those are going to be, those are going to be perennials. All right, anybody have any questions on what we, we went through today? Good? All right, I will see you guys up.